Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast, episode number 92. Greg Evers in his big Colorado muley. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Jackie Bushman of Buckmasters. You're listening to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski. And you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. The Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. This is Milo Hansen, and you're listening to the Big Buck Registry, the Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. I am also joined from the Chubby Tines master and world-class deer namer from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, my friend? Oh, man, just another great show coming up here on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Jay, it's phenomenal, man. It's uh, Tonight, uh, today, we're reaching out to a little bit of our, uh, of our ordinary box. You where, are we going this, where are we going today, Dusty? Where are we going today? We're going on a mule deer hunt out in Colorado. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. It's been a long time coming. It really has, man. We haven't really touched on this subject yet. It's all been... So, you know, uh, big buck, big buck, everywhere a big buck, and a mule deer is absolutely a big buck. They they tend to run bigger. Yeah, right. Than the whitetail, generally speaking. And and the terrain's different. The the hunt style's different. It's it's just something that's out of our box a little bit, and we like it. Totally different. And uh, I'm kind of digging it. Now... We're going to speak to Greg Evers, and Greg, and this is a fascinating story because you don't usually think of this going down like this, but Greg just jumped online to a chat room, basically, a deer hunting chat room, and found some other people that were going there from all across the country, Alabama, some people that live there, but basically scattered around the country where they're all meeting in this one spot. It all started with just a group chat. That, that's amazing. Uh, what the... Uh uh, internet, social media, and all of the forums that you can get onto about hunting, what, what the doors that it can open just by getting involved in a conversation, you know, that that's amazing thing that's happening right now. It is amazing to think that, I mean, it's kind of intimidating in a lot of ways. It's kind of like that, that whole joke we keep talking about, which was catfish, you know, you know, it's going to freak you out a little bit. Right. Absolutely. You know, and, and there's one thing that I'm hoping for, Jay. What's that? That he has not named this buck yet. Mm-hmm. And I'm really getting into naming deer. You're, I got to say, you're very talented at it. And there's things, when we've asked people in the past, what are you going to name this buck? There's nothing popping into my head, but you've got it going. You, it's like you're just a natural at this. And you, the names you come up with, spot on. It's Every crazy. time. It's crazy. It's, it's, one, it. it's one of the things where I'm, I'm like really enjoying that, naming deer. Absolutely. I'm like naming a buck. I think it's so cool. I'm I'm honored to be in the the, clus- the the presence of a world class deer namer. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, I'm gonna take that with with pride and honor to be able to do that. You know, it's one of the things I listen to the story and it just pops in my head. It's pretty crazy. You know what else I'm honored by? What is it? I'm honored by the people that listen to the show. So if you're listening to this show, William Armstrong, Bill Armstrong, I want to say thank you for your donation. Uh, I cannot thank you enough to help us pay the bills around here and support our show. So I just want to reach back out to the people we talked to last week or, or mentioned last week, Jim Keller, Griff Bate, Chris Hunsberger. Just cannot thank you guys enough for donating to our cause here to help us keep this show coming to you each and every week and, and uh, offsetting some of the costs that, that we do incur when we do this radio show. So, if you have a buck extra hanging around, ten bucks, hundred dollars, whatever you can spare, we could sure use your help. If you're a fan of this show, 
And all you have to do is go to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate. And as of this week, we also have a pledge page, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge, where you can actually pledge per show. So if you have a buck, and I do not want you to send in money if you don't have it. If you can't afford it, don't do this. But we can certainly use some help getting our show back on air every, every single week because there are costs aso- associated with a radio show. So thank you to everybody. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yes. Well, I would say, Dusty, it's time to go to Colorado. Let's go to Colorado and hear about uh, the mule deer buck. The big wheel buck. The big wheel buck. Greg Evers, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening? Hey, not a whole lot. Um, thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, we're psyched, man. You're going to take us to Colorado and go, go do some muley hunting, I think. Absolutely. So, we're psyched, yeah, man. Yeah, it was a blast. Where are you right now, Greg? I am in, in Wisconsin right now. Gotcha. Um, are you just, a native? Just hanging out for work. No, I'm a native of Minnesota. I'm in Wisconsin for work at the time. Gotcha. All right, so how did you get from Minnesota to Colorado? What brought you to this this particular area? Well, I, uh, I've i been wanting to go out west hunting for quite a while, and uh, I ended up buying a new bow in January, and I know all the tags and that type of stuff you have to apply for early in the year, and I had talked to some other guys on a forum, and, and they were giving me tips. And uh, I ended up um, just jumping on another forum and meeting some guys, and uh, they invited me out to go to Colorado hunting. Hmm. And I was, it, it actually was, it actually was an elk hunt with you know the bonus mule deer tag on the side. So, oh wow, interesting. So it, yeah, so so I actually had 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 I applied for two tags, and I ended up getting drawn for mule deer. And uh, so yeah. <laughs> That's neat. So, um, t- tell us about how you went. You, so, you did this all online, and you you joined some forums. Yeah, this, this is something we haven't heard yet, Dusty. Um, right, we've never heard that of finding a hunt online through a forum. Now, this is a very interesting topic because oh. I think there's a lot of utility here. Tell us to start with. Tell us what forum you was on. Well, the first one I was on is was a local one from Minnesota. It's called FishingMinnesota.com, okay. and uh, you know they have your typical. For uh, divisions, you know, archery, general hunting, fishing, all kinds of stuff like that. And then, you know, and so I was jumping on the archery one because I'm big into bow hunting. I, I mean, I, honestly, I don't even own a rifle. And uh, so I was asking for some tips and, you know, because guys will post what they uh, what they've what they've done the previous year. And there's some pretty successful guys that go out west that are on that forum and so i was asking about tips and gear and you know where to apply and how to apply and like that and then i ended up uh jumping on another forum called uh bowhunting.com one of the guys like i said ended up inviting uh, a bunch of people kind of a, for, from all over the country we met up out there and he set up a camp for a week and so i didn't have to worry about you know the camp stuff or any of that you know but i brought I, I over purchased on gear. I'd, I'd say I was well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's part of it. You know, you're going somewhere hunting like that. You want to be ready for the hunt. Yeah, I want to. I want to kind of hear that story. Yeah, so, I was. So what? What time of year was it when you were on the forums? This was this was in uh, January, like because I bought my bow like right after Christmas. Okay. And so then I was, you know, I was hard into it. I was, I was shooting every week in the, at the range and stuff. And then, and, uh, so yeah, basically in January, I think I started, you know, looking up hunts and where to go and stuff. And, and these guys, they ended up going right into Colorado. They do this like every other year. And so I'm like, well, I don't have to pay any outfitter fees or nothing like that. So it's all public lands. Cause there's a ton of public land out there and it's, uh, you know, these guys know the area. So I figured, cause I wanted to go elk hunting more than anything right and uh but i've always i've always loved the way mule deer look and i've always wanted to harvest some mule deer and stuff too and so that's why when i saw you could you know i could basically kill two birds with one so stone you know so to say yep, yep. Uh, or at least you know hope to have an encounter <laughs> right <laughs> obviously nothing's guaranteed 
Gotcha. So but, you, uh, you ended up you started so, you started in January this this forum check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you were, you were planning so planning for a fall hunt that same year. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. In September. Okay. And so because for hunting out west up in the elevations and stuff, you know, with those steep grades and mountains, um, I I had actually been to Colorado just for a family vacation like a year before we had gone through that area. Okay. I had actually gotten altitude sickness. Interesting. So okay. I was I was kind of cons- I was kind of concerned about that because <laughs> basically like when I when I got sick or my hands would tingle, you know, and, and you get real lightheaded and and it's hard to breathe and uh, you can't sleep at night. And so we actually kind of had to cut our vacation short where we were at because I I couldn't sleep or anything. I ended up going to my doctor and she gave me some prescription for some stuff that actually really helped between that. And, uh, I did a lot of cardio too. Okay. Cause you know, I was hoping to, you know, have to pack a, an elk out or something, you know? Sure. So I wanted to be in good shape. So what, what was the stuff that they it's, gave you for, to help you deal with altitude sickness? It's, I, I honestly don't remember the name of it. Okay. She gave me three pills and I was like, Oh, that's, that's it. Okay. Hmm. She said, take one. The day before I go, the one the day I get there, and like one the day after or whatever, and that was it. And it actually, so I don't know if it was just because I was more well prepared or that or a combination of everything. And one thing about that is you have to stay extremely hydrated when you're up in them altitude, altitudes. Because we were, our base camp was 8,500 feet. Okay. And so, and we ended up going... We ended up going as high as twelve thousand. Gotcha. All right, so you which is up there. You, <laughs> you start out higher and you go higher. So you, when was the when did you experience the altitude sickness to begin with on the family vacation? When I got up to the top of Pikes Peak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like fourteen thousand feet. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've been up on the top of that, uh, Pikes you know. Peak. It, it's way up there. Did so? Did you? Did at what time of year was that when you actually experienced that? Was the, in March. That was in March. All right, so you you were planning. Yeah. Yep planning the the trip in january you you're in colorado in march on a family vacation and, re, and realized that you've got some altitude situation sickness going on when you were atop of yeah i honestly i didn't know what was happening because like my mouth started getting really dry and i started kind of you know getting real shaky and stuff and i i literally couldn't talk i'd lost so much moisture just from breathing because the air so dry up there yeah, that I was so, and I got so dehydrated, I I couldn't talk or nothing. <laughs> I kind of freaked out a little bit, and everybody up there is, you know, the people working up there, they kind of look at you like, you oh, know, another tourist. You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. Relax and like, yep. okay. Now I've I've been so on top of I've been on top of Pikes Peak before, and I when I was out there, I was in good shape, and I I decided I'd do a few sprints around the top, and it winded me very, very fast. So I, I didn't have the altitude sickness, but th- yeah. just the altitude difference does make a tremendous amount of difference in anything physically you're doing. So when you're planning a deer hunt out there or an elk hunt, this is something that absolutely 100% comes into play. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, I was that was one of the kind of the big unknowns, and you know, my wife was really nervous about that too because she sat there and watched me try to sleep <laughs> and you know that was a long night so but like i said uh when i got to colorado in september or last fall or last year it uh i was fine i had no issues cool so, and, it, and the pills helped when after the prescription so these are prescription i think so pills so in okay excellent now what did you do leading up to going on the trip you said that you were trying to do more cardio are you are you a physical guy to begin with you like to work out in general well yeah um i did a lot of running on the treadmill and and my job is fairly physical too um i deliver food out of a semi so okay i i'm up and down the ramp carting food in and out of restaurants gotcha so you're moving around most of the time i'm fairly physical but yeah i just gotcha i don't i don't have a cushy office job or anything so (laughs) <laughs> not a bad but, uh, thing not a bad thing you know at all. so it, i was you know I, I was trying to trying to keep a good diet trying to you know I, I think i lost like 15 pounds before i went in those six months between 15 and 20 i think excellent but i did a lot of hiking too in the summer because i i got some new boots and i wanted to make sure those were broken and uh so yeah we went to the, we'd go to the local state parks and i'd go take the dog and go out on a walk you know walk a couple miles, stay busy and stuff. 
And I, sh- I shot my bow three, four times a week because we have a, uh, where I live, free public archery range. Okay, yeah. Target really kind of nice because I had never done, you know, obviously any Western hunting yet before. And so I wanted to make sure, you know, about what sh- range is for a shot and stuff. And obviously that varies a lot if you're in, you know, dense timber or out in the open. Um, but I was definitely, I, I would shoot at all the targets, you know, 20, 30, 40, 60 all the way up to 80 and I was I was um getting some pretty good groups too so I mean I had my pin set up I had my uh, last pin at 70 yards and so you know like I, said, I shot all summer long and I you know I would shoot I shot a lot with my broadheads too and uh because I I was using expandables so you can actually you know you can actually uh uh keep those closed just tighten out your set screw in there yeah so then yeah they, they flew they flew really well Greg we're headed to Colorado What's your first step of prepping your your backpack and your luggage to head to Colorado? Let's walk through that. Well, for me, one of the most important things was uh, I got a, a, a water bladder because I wanted to make sure that I was uh, plenty hydrated out there, you know, after, after knowing what dehydration will do to you. And, uh, and so that and, and a, a GPS with, uh, that I got with preloaded maps, that was a big thing too, you know, because that would show – that would help you be able to look at the terrain on there and, you know, obviously how, how steep it would get. And, you know, if there's any creeks or trails or what was by, uh, and like I said, I bought, I probably over prepared because I had, I, you know, I was, I was prepared to, uh, to go spend, you know, three, four nights out in the middle of nowhere with absolutely nothing around. And so I had my tarp and the sleeping bag and, uh, the water filter and you know the 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 waterproof matches and a compass and you know the the game bags and, and I'm trying to remember what it all has <laughs> <laughs> sounds like you, you had just, a lot of stuff yeah yeah like i said it, once after the first couple of days um i cut my pack in half probably because a lot of it was extra stuff that i didn't need Okay. Um, trekking poles helped a lot, you know, because it was it was pretty pretty steep country out there. All right. You know, so we this is on. an interesting point. So, of all the things that you brought, do you remember what things you, you decided you didn't need? What what types of things were in that that pack that you unloaded? Well, I took the I took the tarp out because I wasn't going to need that because we were we were staying in a big base camp that they had set up. And, uh, so I had taken that out and a lot of the stuff I, I made up my own uh, trail mix. So a lot of it was food and stuff like that, like cliff bars and whatever that I would keep with and the water and obviously my, my GPS and, oh, well, I had my, my bow obviously with quivers and, uh, I, I, I bring like six arrows and then I had my release and then I'd bring a spare release with, and then, uh. Oh, I, I I brought my binoculars with, and obviously in a rangefinder, kind of my uh, core set of stuff. Oh, and my uh, obviously like a knife and the game bags. The stuff that I made sure I had with me was was the game bags, my uh, my knives, and I had my phone on me, and and then a and then a small camera with I'd bring too, because I took right. a lot of pictures while I was out there. Absolutely. What kind of bow are you shooting? I uh, I bought a, a Matthews Chiller. Okay. I'm assuming that was, carbon uh, fiber that arrows. Was new, yeah, I had the Victory V8, the VAPS with the outserts. What so kind I was of, shooting over 400 grains. What kind of broadhead are you tipping it with? Uh, the Omer Edge. Omer Edge, grain. okay. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, I just talking to other people, like the guys in the local archery shop, they, they really liked it. They you know they sold a lot of them, and, and they hadn't heard anything bad about them. And uh, I actually brought two different broadheads out there. Um, the Omer Edge... Uh, I was going to use for, for the deer. I had some, uh, some shuttle tees that I was going to use in case as a fixed blade in case I ran into any elk. But I noticed that the shuttle tees, when I was practicing a lot, they were shooting to the left. And so I tried to modify my, my rest a little bit. And then I started wandering with my, the Ulmer edges. So then I just, I decided I was just going to shoot just the Ulmer edges because they shot the most true and that they, they wouldn't wander at all on me. And so, cause I was a little nervous about presentation, you know, if I would get into be able to shoot at an elk with the, uh, with the, cause there's a big debate between fixed blade versus mechanicals for, for something that big. 
and uh, never having taken an animal that big before. I, I wanted to have all my bases covered, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So, when, you, when you go from Minnesota to Colorado, did you have to purchase a different camouflage to take out there? Yeah, I bought, I bought like a Western camel. Uh, I bought some Sitka camel, their optifade pattern, I believe it was called. And the open country, and so it's 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 really nice stuff. It you know it, it's it's more of a like a dusty you know like a tannish color instead of the dark greens like like would be around here. It blends in with the rocks and the, and the openness and stuff. Even though there is a lot of uh, a lot of dark timber there too. Yeah, you know, like I I was just starting to say that there's a lot of different type of terrain. There was huge big chunk rock areas. And then there'd be your dense timber, you know, the dark green timber and stuff. And then there was a lot of aspen where we were at too. And uh, the, it, it was kind of weird because some of the stuff, there, there would be these huge open areas of clear cut where they had the timber companies or whatever came in there and cut all the trees down and stuff. And then, and then there would just, you know, be a solid line of timber. So it'd be wide open. There'd be a bunch of piles of logs and then all of a sudden, bang trees like crazy and then and then you'd see huge pockets of aspen because uh that time of year we went the, the last the last week of the of the hunt of the uh season which is like the third week of september so hmm. the aspens were just turning bright gold at that time it was actually really cool looking gotcha so they're actually going and, into uh, fall then yeah yeah we saw um some of the some of the deer we saw had some velvet on and uh but most of them were were uh had, had already rubbed it off and and we saw a few bachelor groups too and that's you know i was surprised to see that that late i thought that maybe since you know we were, it was supposed to be a little cooler and stuff that they'd already be broken up but the the does were still with the fawns and then the, the bachelor groups were still together because for the most part it was 60 to 70 degrees during the day and low 40s into the 30s at night Gotcha. Do you use any kind of uh, cover spray, like a scent spray? Um, well, out there, I wasn't real concerned too much with it because I was more planning on playing the wind. Um, and some of that clothing, like the merino wool that you wear as a base layer, right? It uh, it's really it's really good at you know not holding scent. And so, I guess that's kind of I was more planning on playing the wind because when you're when you're not around showers and stuff. <laughs> Right, right. I did have some some of the primos that silver spray that silver stuff though. I did use uh, that. Scent. Right. Did uh was you out there was you uh spot and stalking or was you actually tree stand hunting or ground blind hunting? No, we were we were it was all spot and stalk. Okay. Um cuz the mule deer are a little bit different than white tails in that aspect. They don't really hold the same type of feeding pattern, I guess, from what I, <laughs> from what they were telling me. They just kind of randomly wander around. They don't they don't have like a whole range as as much as the whitetail does, I guess. Um, you know, I was prepared to chase, any, you know, however far I had to go, I guess. And uh, a lot of it was like, like I said, learn as I go. I did a lot of reading over the summer and, and uh, tried to talk to some other people. And but I was I was relying on on the people out there that it, the like the locals that were there, the people that had already hunted, you know, with the group before. Because uh, I, I figured the best way to learn is just, you know, just to get out there and, and go with people that have done it before. Now, when you say that you packed a, uh, packed a pair of binoculars, tell us a little bit about what kind of power binoculars and, and what particular brand of binoculars that you took to the field with you. Uh, I had some some Nikon Monarchs that I've had for a few years. Um, they're the 12 by 42. Was that enough power? And uh, for me, yeah. I mean, we weren't, like, we weren't glassing mountains like miles away right and so that was enough power for where we were hunting no i was just saying okay it, that uh, that was just enough the 12 by 42 was enough power to uh reach out to the areas that you were hunting in is there anything i'm going to kind of cut you off there a little bit is there anything uh why it's fresh in your mind that you would change about your setup that you took with you out there is there anything that you can give a kind of like a tip on uh something that you picked up on out there that you would have brought with you that you didn't bring? Um, not, not necessarily. Uh, cause what I, what I brought out there that I ended up using, um, 
was was stuff that I needed, you know. Uh, like like I said, I always had my rangefinder with me. I always had my binoculars and had them on one of the punches. And that, that makes a big difference when they're not bouncing around you all the time. You know, you got them tight to chest and stuff. Mm. And uh, one of the other things is uh, maybe you have boots that fit <laughs> that are broken in. That's, yeah, right. Something that, um, that that's comfortable on your foot it has been for a while, right? Yeah, yeah. Because they what what, the, what I've heard they typically is they recommend to put fifty miles on your boots before you take them out hunting. Mm. And with as steep as those hills were and stuff, and I got I have big feet, so so I got a pair. I had to get fourteens, uh, and so wow, it's hard. To, it's I had to sh- have them shipped in. I I had them shipped in from like. North Carolina or whatever, they were the only pair that they had in the country at the time. They said, because I got them from Cabela's, and they said that they uh, they weren't going to get mine in. I ordered them in January, and they said they weren't going to get them in until August. And I'm like, oh, no, a month to put that many miles on? That's a lot of that's a lot of walking in a short right, period right. of time. But I ended up finding some in, like, uh, I think it was May. I found some. They, had a, they found a pair. And so I had them shipped in, and... That's the only bad part about not being able to try on boots where you know where you're at. I found out that they were a little, they ran a little bit big on me, and with all the side hill and you know walking on the steep grades, yeah, they would move a little bit. But I just wore a thicker pair of wool socks to try and take the space up. But but yeah, uh, a lot of times I would just leave my backpack sometimes, and then you know if we were if we were actually going after something that was you know relatively close to either camp because we actually had some deer pop out behind camp one day <laughs> oh, that's convenient we like that yeah we, we were shooting we were shooting at the targets behind camp and then we looked i looked up on the mountain and let's say maybe 300 yards away or so 350 i saw the back end of a mule deer now i couldn't see his head and i was like hey there's a deer up there <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna go with one of the locals to go check out a spot where he uh, he had shot some big, big mule deer before, and there's also some wallows up there, so we were going to look for elk and mule deer. And uh, so I was already uh, predisposed doing that. So when I took off, they ended up going up there, and uh, it ended up that was a, a, a three-by-four hmm. mule deer that, that she just uh, she had a shot at it, but she, she uh, had ranged the bush, but the deer moved. So... <laughs> As they often do. Yeah, so she was she was waiting for it to come out and stand where that you know at her predetermined range, so she wouldn't have to mess around rearranging the deer. But uh, it was a little closer, so she just shot over. While well, I was up walking that ridge area with the other guy, uh, we almost got ran over by a mule deer doe. I'll tell you one thing: when you're in the when you're in the woods with those things and they get close to you, they're they're kind of they're instead of like throwing a snorting and throwing a tail up like the white tails do. Yeah. These things will hop. You know, if you see if you ever like see them on TV or whatever, when they're going all stiff legged, that that is really loud. <laughs> when, when you're in the woods like that, is it's just yeah, it sounds like someone's taking a baseball bat to a tree. Oh, nice. Good. So, Greg, so, Greg, you're. Let's go back to the spot and stock method that you're doing. Are you are you using vehicles to drive around to to find something as you sl- stop, slow down, look and glass something? If there's something you like, you go and do it. Or are you driving around like the day before to go back to a spot? How is this all playing out? Well, we did kind of both types. Um, we, the area we were in was uh, uh, it's a pretty high traffic area, I guess, because there's there's some mountain roads there. And, uh, so we would, but then there's a lot of back roads. So there's, you know, your main roads and then your back roads. I would drive around with, well, Will was the guy who put the camp on and he would take us and show us certain spots. You know what I mean? And so if we, you know, sometimes we'd see deer on the way to the spots to go, to go look. And, uh, but like I said, a lot of it was does and a lot of, a lot of spike or, uh, fork horns. We saw quite a few deer. There's a lot of mule deer around. Um, a couple, there was, I think five or six other mule deer that were taken at camp, you know, a few does and a couple of smaller bucks. Um, the first day Will shot a really nice, really old mule deer. It was, this thing was super old, but it was, you know, real white and gray ghost faced, you know, I, I would have been real happy taking that, that thing too. Sure. But I was, I was, elk, I was elk hunting 
that day when they were because they went the first day they went uh he went driving and showing a couple of the other guys um some spots and uh so they had saw they had seen a few deer after he shot that one and but yeah we you know we would go find these we'd go up on on the roads and then there'd be just a a break a lot of like i said the uh clear cuts and so we were kind of glass in the clear cuts and we glass, you know, across the other mountains, you know, just to see if the other mountains would have some anything. Like, because there'd be kind of big meadows by the aspens. And so that's kind of where, where we'd look. And uh, Gotcha. This is, it's fascinating because it's a whole different hunt than I'm used to. And it's definitely d- different than what you're experienced, Dusty, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You're out in, uh, you're on big territory there in Colorado and different terrain and elements and elevations. And, you know, the wind blows a little harder there and some days it doesn't, but, uh, there's a whole lot of factors. I, I guess all in all though, the visual that you can put out to, uh, see the animal that you're, you're wanting pers- to pursue is uh, a whole lot easier to, uh, put a spot on from a long distance and be able to uh, utilize the land that's around there and make the stock in for the, for the shot. Yeah. It, uh, you know, some, some places, yeah, you can see miles and miles away. Other places you got about 40 yards as far as you can see. Um, when I was walking down one of the hillsides, I almost walked on top of a fork, uh, a mule deer. Mm. And uh, he just stood there and looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing i'll say about the mule deer uh, they uh they have a little more patience or tolerance than, than whitetails do because you know a whitetail sees you and they're gone they, they don't think twice about it the mule deer will kind of look at you a little bit and then you know then they'll kind of decide so that you get a couple extra seconds which is kind of nice that, that is <laughs> kind of comforting yeah and it, it seems like the the way in which you hunt them is it's constant activity so you're always in the game whereas whitetail hunting if you go on those those little droughts of you know those days or f- days connected together that you don't see something, it kind of weighs on your psyche. But it seems like this is a, always a way to keep you in the game because you're always doing something and finding animals for the most part. So you're always kind of you're you never really getting the down on yourself. Yeah, that's the one thing I really loved about that out there. There was you, you were never just sitting there doing nothing. You're you know just twiddling your thumbs. You were, you, you were actively pursuing them and going after them and looking for them. And, you know, so you're always moving around doing something because sometimes in the stand, I get a little bit, you know, fidgety and bored and, <laughs> right. you know, it's, but, but out here, yeah, there's, you know, if you don't see anything, just move on to the next mountaintop or, or, you know, the, the down the next road or up the next trail, wherever. Uh, Cause these things, they, they'll be anywhere, you know, they usually stayed below where we were. They were usually below, like between ten and eleven thousand feet was kind of their their uh, as as high as we saw them, and, and the elk were higher. But uh, so we kind of knew kind of the the edge of their territory, you know, if you will. That once we went up above eleven thousand feet, there typically weren't going to be any mule deer where we were at. I know they do go high, but like I said, where we were at, they were usually between nine and ten thousand feet. Gotcha. Okay. So let's let's go, let's talk about the the last forty eight hours prior to the kill. Uh, tell us kind of what was going on in camp around uh, you know forty eight hours prior. Okay, so that day we got I got there on Saturday, and so then Sunday I went elk hunting with uh, with a couple of the guys. We went walking around, and we ended up seeing across this meadow. I saw a, a huge bull. I think it was huge, probably three hundred fifty yards away, and it was probably like 10 minutes before sunset and this thing was just massive and and uh and at first you know we, we went back to camp because he just wandered back in the woods and there was nothing we could do so we had got back into camp and uh the plan was for me and and a couple of the other guys to go to try and find that elk again originally at night and well we talked about it because it was will had will had shot his deer on sunday and so then he's like well you know, we kind of, kind of moved around and we're like, I'll go, I, I, I ended up going mule deer hunting with, with him. He was going to show me some spots and, uh, a gal named Christine and then another, and she was from Utah and then another guy from Alabama, his name was Pat. And so basically us four went, uh, on Monday, we went driving around. So he was going to show it so he could show us some spots. 
So we saw a few does and stuff, and then we got we glassed a few areas. About noon, we were driving up on this overpass over this big clear cut area, and I just happened to see about down the down the hillside is right this, these huge giant piles of wood, of logs that were all stacked up from being clear cut. I looked down there and I saw a couple mule deer down there, and so we stopped and we, you know everybody got out the binoculars and we were we were glassing them, and because uh, they're I, they're between 340 yards away I think somewhere around there, and uh, it happened to be this this just this absolute monster deer. It was a huge I, I think it was a five by five, um, and Will said Will's from there and he said it it's the biggest deer he's ever seen on the hoof in Colorado. Really? Which yeah. Which was just, I mean, this deer was so cool. It, it was real wide um, and just, just massive and tall. And we, he figured it probably would go about 230. It was, it was just insane. He shot a lot of animal, a lot of animals. Wow. And uh, the deer, and there was another deer with. There was three deer total. Um, the other deer with them was was a nice four by four, I guess you'd call it. Out west terms, you know, I had the brow tines too. Sure, or an eight and, eight uh, pointer out out uh, east. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, and so that one looked average compared to this other one, and, and apparently that's all I needed to see before I grabbed my bow and started hoofing it down the mountain. <laughs> and so, uh, me and Pat was behind me, and uh, I, we grabbed our bows and we started moving around the terrain because there was a like a natural uh uh a ridge where we were going we were i was going straight down the mountain and then there was like a little ridge between us and and the deer so i was running like the deer were they were working their way down to this real thick these real thick evergreens hmm. and uh and so i was pretty much running down the down the mountain they couldn't see me at all and i was downwind of them too so uh, so, so I was moving and I left Pat in the dust. <laughs> <laughs> it was all that training you did before you got there. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And so I, I was hoping it down there and I got down close to the, close to the evergreens and, uh, and I heard something down in the trees and I went, huh, I hope that wasn't what I thought that was. <laughs> and, but it, so yeah. I'm like, well, I got to keep going. Cause I didn't see them and I, and you know, nobody is doing hand signals to me or nothing like that. So, so I, w- I kept working my way along the ridge and I, and I made it behind the wood piles. There's like four or five of them, I guess. And, uh, I, I got to the one where I'd la- where I had last seen them. You know, and I suppose this is maybe 10 minutes, maybe at the most. Okay. After, after I started running. And, uh, so I drew my bow and, you know, stepped out from behind the wood. And of course the deer were gone. And so they obviously had made it to the, to the woods before, before I got down there and that was them. So then, so we walked back up to the truck and, uh, decided to, to make a plan for, you know, to come back tomorrow morning. Cause we figured they'd still be in the same area. Uh, so we were going to come back in the morning before daylight and just kind of set up spread out along that ridge there and uh in hopes that the deer would you know work either work their way down from from feeding at night or whatever and or uh or work their way out of the woods you know but uh but that was you know i wish i could have got some pictures of those of that monster deer (laughs) right and so that was kind of we so we headed back you know we checked a couple other spots and and didn't, didn't run into any deer and uh we headed back to the camp and it was kind of like, you know, everybody kind of kept it silent. <laughs> we, you know, we were, we were all gung ho on going back out again, you know, we're going back out. So, you know, that's what we're doing, <laughs> but we didn't want to say why, you know? Gotcha. So they were, you're kind of, everybody was being quiet about what you had seen. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, one of the other guys though, that, that was a good friend of Will's, uh, he, uh, he's from Alaska. And he works for Bass Pro Shops up there, but uh, you know he ended up uh, getting informed about this deer because he had passed up a nice three by three because he was looking for something something big, and uh, he goes, I, "I at least want a four by four, so I passed on the smaller ones. Yeah, and and uh, so we knew that he knew about it, but he wasn't he he was going to go in a little different area, and so but yeah, so we were we were ready to go, man, in the morning. That was that was. <laughs> I fun. bet. So how much? <laughs> 
how much sleep did you get that night once you realized that what was out there? Well, I don't know. It was tough because, you know, with with the whole camp being around, I suppose, you know, there's at that time there was either between 50 and 20 people, uh, but not everybody had mule deer tags. Most of the people just went there for elk hunting. So it was, that was mm. kind of nice, too. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, so you got your camp dynamic and, it, you know, everybody's. Yeah, the fires and stuff. You know, it, it was just it was just a blast being out there in general. Sure, nice. Oh, where exactly is is Deer Camp? By the way, I, I don't think we asked you that. Where in Colorado are you? We are um, in the the Holy Cross Wilderness area, I guess. It's it's we're we're just south of Vale. Okay, that's that's where it is. It's a huge area. Um, you know, like I said, it's all all that public land. There's so much land you can hunt. But that that unit um, is is yeah, not too far south of Vale. Okay, so you you saw this monster the night before, and you put a move on it. it didn't work out. You, right. s- you sleep on it you, if you can call it that, and everybody's pumped up to go the next day. Everybody has mule tags, and pretty much everybody has a place they're going. So, yep. what time did you get up? Oh. At least an hour before light. Okay. Probably an hour and a half. So I, I suppose four thirty maybe, I, if I remember right. Was it time? Time changes different out there. <laughs> They're an hour earlier than than us. It says uh, two hours earlier than you guys. But uh, yeah, we were up way early because I suppose we had about a half hour drive just to get to the mountain. And uh, and so yeah, we were we were up bright and early. We all jumped in the truck and headed over to that mountain. And uh, crept down there and kind of, kind of, uh, like I said, just spread out across that that hillside, sitting, you know, in the wood piles and you know, in the in the trees and stuff. And so, yeah, we were uh, we were there plenty early. How many people went with you th- that morning to the same spot? Just there was just three of us. Three, yeah, okay. Yeah, me, me, Pat, and Christine. Okay. And so, and then Rob, Rob had ended up going. He went uh, further. He went higher than us, I suppose. Uh, I don't know exactly how far up the mountain he was from us, but he was in the same general area. And so we, it, you know, like it started getting, sun, the sun started to rise and uh, all we saw was a doe and two fawns. Mm. They, uh, they headed across the ridge above us and, you know, and, that, and we're like, oh, okay. So we, I think we sat there till eight. So, you know, we gave it a good couple hours or so, I suppose. Okay. And no dice, nothing to do it because... <laughs> this is the funny part because that those two deer or th- that we saw the day before were above us by Rob. So, <laughs> uh-huh. and so, and so from what I've, from what I understand that that happens is he saw that he, he got within 55 yards of that monster deer and he's, he's a really good shot. He goes, shoots Las Vegas every year and, and all that good stuff. And uh, he said he let an arrow go. He said he watched that mule deer turn his head, and that arrow ricocheted right off his antlers. No way. Uh, <laughs> he said that. He goes, I wanted to cry. Oh, man. I mean, you oh. talking about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, that later that night, you know, back at camp, he's just sitting there shooting at the target going, why didn't it do that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, so this is – this is like I said, Tuesday morning now. And so when, when we left, uh, we didn't even know he was there yet. And so we started heading down the mountain. We were watching that doe and the fawn and, and, uh, we're like, all right, we might as well head down the mountain. And we ended up seeing a, a mule deer fork that, uh, Pat wanted to, he just, he wanted to get a good shot at mule deer. And so, so we put a stock on that and we kind of held back and he, he got within about 30 yards or so of it. And uh, so he sent an arrow off, and he hit it a little bit high, but, uh, you know, it was a decent hit. And we watched it run off uh, into the trees, and then we gave it a couple minutes to kind of kind of walked up to where he had hit it. And uh, we saw, we, we found a little bit of blood, but then we kind of were like, well, we'll just back out and uh, give it some time. It'll come back in like 45 minutes or an hour. And so, so then we headed down the mountain a little bit more. And when you say you're heading down the mountain, are you – progressively working towards a certain point on a, using your GPS or are you just kind of meandering downward out of yeah, the we're elevations? Just kinda, yeah, we're just kind of on the trail, just kind of kind of wandering, you know, just looking around, checking some decent, you know, some 
timber and aspens and whatever, just looking for deer. Because they'll just they'll just be there. You know, you'll okay. just all of a sudden see one. And when you say a trail, does that mean there's there's a, a road, uh, an old yeah, kind of more, yeah, basically a, yeah, old logging road, okay, you will, or whatever, okay. And uh, I mean, we didn't go we didn't go very far. I suppose that 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 the fork that the pat shot was maybe half a mile down down the road and uh so then we we kind of kept going down a little bit more and and i ended up i looked up and saw that deer um or the one the one that i the one that i was going to shoot at he was in the aspens and it was weird because there was like this 15 foot wide like lane basically (laughs) I mean, to me, when I saw, I saw all I saw was this monster body in about half his rack, mm. and I was like, "I'm definitely shooting this deer," <laughs> and I'm like, "Cause, cause I'm like, this is like, it, it looked huge," and it was. I had Christine was right next to me, and I said, "We, cause we got, I, we jumped in the brush. Or, well, jumped in the brush. It, we got behind some brush, and and I wanted to get all ready, and." uh how far out is the deer at this point? Well, it's 75 yards. Okay. And so I'm like, well, it was just standing there broadside and I, I wanted to get, I wanted to get my bow ready and everything. And I wanted her to range it for me. So I wouldn't have to mess around with, you know, ranging it myself and then, you know, and then draw my bow and stuff like that. And I'm like, yep. well, she's, you know, someone's there to help you. Why not? And so I'm like, all right. I said, so give me. So she got behind me and I said, all right, what's the yardage? And she said, 75. And I went, all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never shot an animal that far before, but it, like I said, I'd practice all summer long at 80 yards and stuff. And I knew where my, I knew I had my 70 yard pin and I put it right on his back and I let the arrow go and he kind of hunched up and he kind of walked cause he was, he was right by the, the other, other trees. So he like right away, he, he was gone. And I'm like, all right. So, so he, knew, a couple he knew he got hit. You like immediately you, you, you knew you hit him hard and, and he took off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And then you, and then you get like going, okay, pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so then, so then I'm like, uh, Pat stood where I was standing and, and slowly, you know, cause I don't want to push him. I didn't, you know, or nothing like that. So I started walking up, climbing forward up this mountain. It was, it was so steep, <laughs> you know, you get so excited that you don't really realize how steep it is having not hunted like that before. And so I'm basically, I start climbing up this hill and I trip over a log and fall forward. But <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't really fall. You just kind of, you just kind of, Oh, and, and right. so then I'm going, man, this is steep. And so I got up and I turned around and I look at Pat and I'm going, man, how far up was this thing? Like it didn't look that far, um, because the body was so big. Mm. And so, so I'm getting up to about where he was because I had I kept my rangefinder with him, so I so I would range Pat, and I and I'm like, all right, this is right. So then I, I look around a little bit, and I found my arrow. So I it, I had a complete pass through. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Nice. And uh, so the arrow looked good, and I look kind of looked around a little bit, and. Uh, just blood everywhere. I mean, it, the thing was just shooting blood. You know, blind man could follow that trail. Right. So I'm like, well, if there's this much blood, I, you know, maybe I'll, I'm gonna slowly follow it. You know, and, and try not to, try not to bump it or anything. I'll just, you know, just slowly work my way after it. Because this is probably, probably 15 minutes after, after I shot him. You know, it took me a little while to get up the hill, and so, and so I started following it, and he's bleeding out both sides like crazy. And so I follow it. About about 40 yards, I suppose, and where I was in the aspens, and there was a lot of dirt. So there's more more dirt than than grass or leaves than anything else. Hmm. And and so then I get to a point where the blood where he stopped, and there was just pools of blood on both sides, and then, and then there was just nothing. And I'm like, oh man, did I bump him? What happened? So I kind I was looking because he was following a trail, so I was looking up the trail ahead of me, and I'm like, I didn't see any blood, I didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything. And I'm like, oh. So I turn around and I look down the hill, and about 20 yards down the hill, he had, the deer was laying all pinned up against the tree. Nice. He had, he, had, he had rolled down the hill. Excellent. Like crazy. And actually, like the day before, I was, you know, we, we, we got along real well, all, all of us. And so I told him, I said, if I shoot one of those big deers, I'm going to yell, suck at your back. 
<laughs> you got, you know, the old, the, the Will Ferrell Jeopardy gag on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know why that came into mind. I just, you know, we're just goofing around. <laughs> and so, so I look down, I see this deer. And like I said, I didn't honestly understand how big this deer was. And so I get, I get down to him and I like, was like hyperventilating, just freaking out, you know, like, nice. oh my God. Oh my. <laughs> and I, and, and those guys were still on the trail back, you know, I suppose hundred yards away from me or whatever they were. And so I screamed at the top of my lungs. I just yelled, soccer to back. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so that was just letting them know that I, that I got him. And, uh, but that's one thing that was, that was nice is it was all literally all downhill from there. <laughs> so th- th- this must've been a, a, a monster deer. I mean, it looked like a big body when it was on its hoof. So what do you yeah. do from there? Now you've got the deer down and it's, is it, when you say downhill from there is the rest of the hunts downhill or you do have to, this, you have to, you have to bring the deer downhill to your camp from that point. Well, we, like I said, we were on a different mountain about a half hour away from camp. Mm. So it was literally, uh, it was just dragging him downhill to the road. Okay. You know what I mean? To the nearest road. So gotcha. it was instead of having, you know, there's a lot of on those Western hunts. You see guys have to quarter their animals out, right. pack, backpack them out and stuff. Yeah. Well, I was lucky where I was at that literally I could just take the whole deer down and uh, we ended up getting them into my truck. Um, and I actually had, I, I went, I couldn't do this by myself because there was a lot of down logs and stuff. And and he was, honestly, I think he was, he was over 275 pounds. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sure he was because we didn't have a scale to weigh him. But, uh, but when I took him in, I had 100 pounds of meat off him. So. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> muleys in general are just big animals. When you get a big, mature muley, they're just bigger than whitetail, generally speaking. They're just big animals. So I, yeah. you, you got to think he's he's got to be pushing 300. That uh, That's what I was thinking, you know. <laughs> uh, I was hoping. I, I would have loved to have a scale in camp and stuff. Right. But uh, but I, I went back down and met up with, them other, with the other guys, and, and uh, Rob came down the trail too. Um, and so I actually had him come up and help me. So he kind of grabbed half the back legs and I grabbed his head and, uh, we were pulling or he was pulling us slash us lifted him over stuff. And actually at one point this, there was a big old Aspen log, you know, a couple foot off the ground. And, uh, so we, you know, kind of did the old one, two, three type of thing. And I, I, I had him by the antlers and I did, I, you know, everything I could do, do not let the antlers hit anything, you know, <laughs> save the cape, you know, all that good stuff. And, uh, so Rob lifts him over and the back end falls and his deer twists. And all I hear is his neck breaking as I'm oh, holding on to the deer and he's dragging me down the hill. With him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I probably look like a, like a clown, you know, right. <laughs> as much as I was falling down and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I was just so elated, you know, I was like on cloud nine. Oh yeah. And, your adrenaline must've been going and your excitement and just, yeah, I mean, to, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like taking an animal that, that you're very proud of. I mean, there's just nothing like it. You're like I, I did this. I can't yeah. believe it. The, the great thing and being, you know, traveling distance and sealing the deal that don't get no better. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, my, that, I mean, my hunt was made, you know, uh, from there, you know, <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it was, it, and for it being my first mule deer and my first out of state hunt, you know, I'm sure people are going to hate me for that, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I, I got really lucky just with the people that I met out there and, and, uh, you know, just running across, running in, into the right spots in the right areas. Uh, and so we got him down. I took, we, I got some pictures taken, you know, some really nice ones in the Aspens with the nice gold leaves and stuff like that mm. and all over. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it was really cool. So then I got it on there and then we, we found, uh, not too far off the road. I backed my truck up and, uh, we, uh, actually just slid him right into the back, <laughs> back of the pickup. <laughs> I didn't even have to lift him up because there was a big berm. You know, oh, where beautiful. it dropped out of the road. Yeah. And, and, uh, and after that, 
we went and and tracked down Pat's deer, who would, that was right by the road too. For some reason, it it, it went probably three four hundred yards, I think. And uh, so then, yeah, I just lifted him in there too. <laughs> so we got two wheel deer in the back of my pickup. That's a good day, man. That's a good day. So you ended. You said you're a pickup truck. You ended up driving there as opposed to flying out. Sounds like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I made the drive out there because um, with all the stuff I had and wanting to bring, you know, hoping to bring meat back. I don't know how expensive it is to fly meat back, but I don't think it'd be cheap. Right. But it was about 17 hours, I think, for me to drive out there. That's worth it. That's worth the experience and having your own vehicle and getting your meat back. The way you want it, yeah, that's definitely a cool, cool experience, man. That's awesome, Greg. That's that's a heck of a tale right there. Yeah, it was it was such a blast. And then uh, we had one of the guys, or Will, uh, rough scored it when he got back into camp because he had been gone for a couple days. And I sent a well, well, when I was out there uh, taking pictures and stuff, I sent him a, a photo of it, and you know, he called me right away and congratulated me. And you know, he goes, "That's a deer of a lifetime." And it, it was, and it, it, it's just, it's just crazy to think that that other bigger mule deer made this one look pedestrian, you know? Right. <laughs> right. Like, how insane is that? That's and, crazy. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't the biggest one that you'd seen, but it was a darn nice deer when it was all said and done. Yeah. It, uh, it taped out at, uh, 184 and six eighths. Nice. Uh, green, green score. And it netted. 180 and two ace. Nice. That's awesome. And, and it was it was basically perfect. There was no uh, deductions or anything. It was perfectly symmetrical and wow. You know, yeah, it was. And then from uh, from the skull to the tip of the G twos is 29 inches long. <laughs> wow. And some big main beams. That's huge. Very cool. So, Dust, you want to ask him the question that you love to ask? Did you name that book? You know, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I I never really got into naming deer. I just is I just had, but I didn't even thought about it really. Greg, you're in luck. <laughs> Dusty is a world class deer namer. Oh, I I'm in the presence of greatness then. Yes, you are. And <laughs> I, I don't know if he's gonna. Sometimes it takes him a day or so. But Dusty, you got anything uh, brewing right now? I'm gonna call him Big Will. That's the Big Will Buck. The Big Will Buck. I like it. What do you think, Greg? Yeah. Um, that's great. Greg, could you tell us, and, and, and this is different for every hunter, what's your number one hunting tip? If you had to have just one, what would you say? Well, especially, like I said, for this year, and but but overall, I would, as for archery hunters, I would definitely um, put a lot of practice time in and, and especially practice with your broadheads because they all shoot different and you, need to, you definitely need to tune your bow to that broadhead. Cause, uh, like I said, the, uh, the shelties I was shooting were shooting way to the left. And, you know, if I went to shot with them, if I would have just went out there and just said, well, flies like a field tip, you know, right. You know, I'm I'm missing the deer type of thing. So, gotcha. uh, yeah, at 75 yards, that's, you you don't, you don't want to have any degree of error at all. No. Yeah. No, and uh, yeah, I was just that. It's just crazy to think is that far away, especially when I got up when I got up there and ranged back toward Pat. You know, uh, I was like, yeah, this is a this is a definite serious uh, serious poke. But like I said, you know, putting in the practice time, um, knowing what your equipment is, can do, that really helps. You know, that's a necessity because obviously the rifle guys will spend, you know, a lot of time at the range shooting, you know, different yardages and stuff. And it's the same for bow hunters. Right. Well, Greg, that's fantastic. And I can't thank you enough for sharing that story. It, it was intriguing. It was something we haven't heard before. And I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, just trying to visualize what was going on. And you did a great job telling that story. And I appreciate that. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. It's really beautiful country out there. And, uh, I can't wait to go back this year too. Nope. So, and actually, this year I'm taking the whole family with, so they can they, they can hang out in the hotel or, or not in the hotel, but you know, they yeah, can, I can't. There's a lot of stuff to do out there, and uh, that's I'll cool. I was just going to ask you, uh, and you answered the question: Are you going back next year? And that's a definite. So, very nice. 
Uh, Dusty, get any last questions for Greg? You know, I don't, Greg. Uh, you told a great story. And, uh, man, what excitement to hear the story about Big Will. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was just, it, it, it's fun talking to you guys. It was, it was a blast on the hunt and hopefully many more to come, you know? Absolutely. I'm sure. And, and thanks for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. No problem. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to go mule deer hunting. I'm already, like, scrolling, trying to look at some public hunting ground Colorado. Yeah. Now. That's the cool part. It's, like, all this public land. I mean, I didn't expect him to say that. I figured he was tied up in some private area, but turns out he's not. Yeah, it's amazing what, uh, you know, just looking at there's thousands of acres in Colorado that's public hunting. It looks like you need to apply for your tags a little bit earlier in the year, January, February, you know, 1st of February. But uh, other than that, you get in the lottery and, and maybe you'll look out and draw a mule deer or elk tag out west. It's fascinating. I th- my dad has done this before, and he had a great time. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, I, I haven't done it either. It's something I've always dreamed about. Something I've always dreamed about, too. I think we should do this, Dusty. I think I think uh, we need to set a year to have this uh, be an accomplishment in our lives. Definitely. And if if they're you know if we maybe we jump on a chat room, start chatting it up, or if we've got some listeners out there that have done this, we'd love to hear from you. And a great place to reach out to us seven two four six one three two eight two five, or shoot us an email J or Dusty at bigbuckregistry dot com. You can just tell us that hey, I've done these private hunts out there are these public hunts not private hunts these public land hunts for muleys out in colorado we'd love to hear a little bit more about that because i think we need to do that i'm in i'm in i'm definitely in yeah it'd be a cool experience and yeah definitely thank you to greg for jumping on with us on the show here and telling the story about uh, the big will buck man what amazing great story and jay i just love to name these bucks you're great at it, man. You're a world-class deer namer. So do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week, Dusty? We do, Jay. And I'm, I'm going to get into uh, what time of year it is. My tip of the week is going to be that uh, right now it's time to get a mineral site established and going. You know, yep. uh, Check out Horny Buck Seed Company. They, they definitely uh, offer some great mineral products. And you also check out Infraction Whitetail Deer Mineral out of Kentucky and then uh you know most mineral companies if they're on the market they're they're doing things with their products that uh, are working so you know definitely check out minerals and get your mineral sites going it's that time of year it is that time of year and this is the time of year you want that after they've been a wintering and uh they need some some vitamins basically get get their nu- nutrients back up right yeah you know and and if you don't know, uh, antler growth is uh, a necessity of excess m- nutrition and mineral. and So you want to get them on the right levels of mineral and, and make the best antler growth that you can. Completely agree. So it's that time of year. We, we still got, got about a foot of snow left, man. It's still it's crazy. Still New hands are unreal. But it's going away fast this week. So I think we'll be cutting grass here in Ohio in about two weeks. It's insane. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm living in the right spot, but man, I love deer hunting in New Hampshire. It's just, just the passion of mine. It's, it's a tradition and there's no other place in the country that's like it, even though we don't have the big racks, uh, like you find in other parts of the country. I just, I just like the culture of hunting in New Hampshire. So I don't know, even if I didn't live here, I think I'd always have to come back here for deer season. Right. You know, it's, uh, it's not always about the, the biggest rack in the woods. It's about the, the memories and, the life-changing events that you encounter along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, let's see. So how can we find you, Dusty, off you can of the check, show? You can check me out at facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. You know, I'm involved right here at the Big Buck Registry. You can shoot me an email at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Dusty. Jay, how can the folks reach out to you when you're not on the air at the Big Buck Registry? When I'm not at Big Buck Podcast Studios, I would say, uh, first and foremost, we'd like to invite you to come and join us on iTunes, and I'd really like to hear from you about what you think about this show. One of the things that we haven't gotten in a while uh, is a, a whole bunch of reviews. So if you are an avid listener of this show and you have and you are on iTunes, 
please, please, please leave a review about this show so we can get a bearing on how we've been doing lately. And if you have a, a big buck that you'd like to share with us, the best place to go is bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck. You can always email me, jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Give us a call, 724-613-2825. And if you have an extra buck to support the Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, and you can spare a dollar or a 50 or a 100 or however much money you want to spare, we could certainly use some help. And you can visit us in two spots, bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate which you'll see a a big green button, and that'll lead to a PayPal page, and you can donate any denomination that you want. Or if you'd like to pledge per show, we have a pledge page set up now, and that's at bigbuckregistry.com forward slash pledge. Otherwise, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. Twitter is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're now on Instagram, which is bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Instagram. And you can also find us on Overcast, uh, the Prepper Network, and stay tuned, April 1st, something big, something huge. Uh, I cannot wait to let everybody know what we got going on for April 1st. It's going to be a a great thing. I really want to tell people right now, but I can't. April 1st, it's not not an April Fool's joke. This is going to be fun. It's going to be huge, and if you're a outdoor podcast content listener and consumer this is off the charts it is off the charts and that's a fact jack fact jack so dude i think that's a wrap yeah great show jay and uh what what a phenomenal story about the the big wheel buck uh, colorado mule deer man just cannot wait till the the following week to see what comes your way here at the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm Dusty Phillips. And I'm Jay Scott. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.